Welcome to Behind the Schemes, a discussion of how commerce, corruption, and counterfeit cures are destroying our planet's precious wildlife. This is Risha Kota Larsen with Behind the Schemes, and in this episode, we're talking to author and blogger Jeremy Hans from Manga Bay about his new book, Life is Good. Conservation in an Age of Mass Extinction. What inspired you to write your book? Well, the book actually evolved um, from uh, conversations with my boss, uh, Rhett Butler, who is the founder and creator of MangaBay.com, where I work. And yeah, so we were just looking at some of, you know, we were talking back and forth via email and looking at some of different articles that I'd done in the past. And there were sort of a number of articles that were larger, uh, more expansive and kind of ideas articles looking at new research or looking at sort of global implications of biodiversity decline. And, you know, we thought there might be a a good chance of putting some of these together into a collection. Um, And then from there, the idea just expanded. And we started, I started looking for material that I had written that hadn't been published. And I started combining articles and it took on a whole new different thing than what I first envisioned, which was good. Um, And I just found a lot of different material to use and uh, wrote some new stuff and we put it together in a collection. And, you know, the idea was really to try and capture the global um, view of biodiversity, how biodiversity is uh, declining rapidly and that many scientists are concerned that we're going to enter an age of mass extinction if we haven't already entered it. Um, But also to, to give a number of stories that are looking at one specific species and what scientists are doing or looking at one new tool such as camera traps and look at how that's changing conservation. So giving sort of both a macro and micro view of of our planet and the life on it and how it's doing and what we can do to make sure it's still around for our kids and grandkids and everybody. Oh, fantastic. And what was it like going from blog to books? I've been reading your blog for a long time. And so what was that transition like? Well, I when I initially started writing, I, I wrote a lot of fiction, so I always envisioned books. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, ended up being an environmental journalist. So, it, you know, but it was very different because when you write on a blog, you're usually doing updates on past stories you've written or something that's sort of news of the day or something that's kind of meant to be read and digested, you know, that week or that mm-hmm. month um, isn't necessarily meant to maybe be read some of it is, but not all of it's meant to, you know, be read two decades from now and, and will still be as applicable as it is now. So a lot of it's, you know, when you write for a blog, you're writing on new studies that are coming out and then you're, next year we write on a different study that says even more on that or updates the information. So, but with the book, I have really tried to focus on things that I'd written that had a, more of a longer lasting appeal, things that I thought would still be important a decade from now, maybe even more important. Um, So it was really a question of how long, uh, you know, what species and what places are really important and what issues are really on the forefront. So the book is looking at a lot of ideas that are really quite new in conservation and a lot of tools that have changed it and a lot of ideas that I think will become much more important as, you know, in, in the next few years even. So um, that was one thing. And then also just the fact that you can't go back and change your book. So there was a lot. <laughs> more, yeah. Un- you know, unfortunately, in some ways now with Kindle, maybe you could. But mm-hmm. uh, there's there's a lot more focus on making sure all the everything is, is there that you want and everything is all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and, and the detail um, that you wanted to capture is there and is, you know, double checking everything many more times and things like that. You can't, you know, you can't go email a researcher again after it's published and say, what did you mean when you said this? <laughs> so you have to do that beforehand. Um, so that's, that's one, you know, the, the internet is a, is a strange new tool where we can, we can update things on the spot and books, I think in many ways to their benefit, you can't, you're, when you, when you get to the printing press, that's it. So, uh, we wanted to create something that had a little more of a, a longer shelf life and, um, was going to tell a, a, a sort of a global story through lots of different stories, um, which I think we do on Manga Bay as well, but we, we really looked for the right stories for this one to sort of give it, you know, in, in 200 pages, what can you say about biodiversity? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was excellent. I mean, I I think that you really uh, hit it with the book. I think it's great. Thank you. What was the most challenging chapter for you to write? Well, I think the most challenging chapter, um, each chapter posed unique challenges, but the most challenging one was probably for almost more emotional reasons was the the book, the chapter, I I did a chapter specifically looking at oceans, Mm -hmm. um, which was a, you know, it's a global issue, but I think it's, it's, it's in many ways almost more shocking because we can, we can look at our landscape and we can see that it's changed. We can see when forests are cut down, we can see mining going on, we can see when we're drilling for fossil fuels, we can see cities rising, you know, these things, um, we can sort of see the developments happening and the changes happening and we can see the species, um, as they are and but in the oceans it's a lot harder to see the changes and I think that it's only in the last 30 40 years when scientists are really realizing just how much we've done to the oceans and how much they've changed um, through things like overfishing which is a massive problem Mm -hmm. um, climate change which is changing the very chemical structure of the oceans and really imperiling coral reefs and pollution um, just plastics uh, debris, chemicals, all these things are really shaping, creating a new world for the oceans and one that's, that for most scientists looks quite dire and gonna. Uh, there's a lot of predictions of mass extinction now which would have been unheard of 50 years ago for the oceans. It, the idea that we could somehow deplete the oceans of the species would have been almost ridiculous to somebody because um, they're, they're vast, you know, they're untouched, you, you know, but just because we can't all go and travel to the depths of the oceans like James Cameron doesn't mean we we don't affect it every day with our decisions and our our the way our economy works. So I think that that chapter was particularly difficult just because it it's a really eye opening as to just how much humans have impacted um wildlife and our ecosystems that everybody depends on, including us. Yeah, the, the it was interesting you mentioned in your book that at one time uh, people did believe that the oceans were completely limitless and there would be no end to what could be taken from the ocean, that it was completely unknown. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the ocean has always kind of been a great metaphor and poetry for the vastness, the boundness, mm-hmm. the, the, the depth of it. Um, and there are a lot of even scientists who thought, you know, you can fish as much as you want because you're never going to deplete how many, you know, fish you can take. And it's interesting, too, to think that... Uh, for whaling, um, whalers, some, not all of them, but some of them did think that there was just, you could whale as much as you wanted because you could never actually cause the extinction of a whale. Ugh. And we know now with the fact that we actually can monitor populations that that wasn't true, that many of these populations of whale were near the beginnings of extinction were collapsing um, by the time we put the moratorium on whaling in place. And by the time, you know, sort of our need for whale blubber had changed. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the, that shows, I think, the importance of scientific research, that it's, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, we can never fully destroy the tropical rainforest. Well, that's not exactly true. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it isn't. <laughs> understanding that that's not a rainforest. So I think that that's something that that's important to think about when we think about conservation and environmental issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, uh, in Chapter 8... That was a that was a really fascinating chapter. You wrote that zoos need a revolution, and you also said that you visited zoos on four different continents. So I've I've been to zoos in a lot of poor countries, and mm-hmm. I've been to zoos in a lot of wealthy countries, mm-hmm. meaning like Europe and and North, you know, China, uh, uh, USA and Canada and such. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, so I would say that, you know, I've seen some horror stories in zoos. Uh, most of them are in countries where really they don't have the resources and the funding mm-hmm. to do it. I've, I've been to, and I'm not going to tell you where the zoo is. But okay, yeah, that's I fine. To, yeah, I, I went to one zoo where there was warning signs everywhere about getting too close to the fences because the animals were so vicious that they would just attack you. And these are like birds and things. And so you, you have to wonder about the sanity of these, these creatures at Ugh. that point. Um, it's, it was a pretty dire situation, but I was in a country that was quite poor, um, where there was very little funding for these zoos, and um, so I think at that point, it's you know, it, it, as, as atrocious as it is, it is understandable that there's just 
there was just no way that these zoos really could even sort of start to change without some interest, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe from outside. Maybe they needed some help. Um, But what really frustrates me about zoos is is not so much those zoos, because as sad as it is, and as much as you want to in some ways just close them down, there is an understandability about how they get to that place. Mm -hmm. What frustrates me is that you have a lot of zoos in wealthier countries that I just feel like put a lot of money into projects that maybe don't have the biggest conservation um, outcome or that sort of they, where I think they've really missed the boat is, is on education. Um, I've spent a lot of time at zoos and you can go through a lot of zoos and learn very, very little. Um, you can learn nothing about ecosystems. You can ver- learn very little about the animals that you're seeing. Uh, you can tell that from just comments that people make. Um, signs are often kind of low on information and almost very rarely address uh, environmental issues or how people can make a difference or the fact that, you know, these animals are almost gone. And so I think that that's where I see zoos needing to step up is on the education frontier. Um, I think that the idea of sort of making zoos better for animals has been accepted and is making its way around the world. Some countries are slower than others, but I think where we really need to do is is start to look at zoos as a place where people can learn about nature because we've we've lost a lot of our connection to nature and for a lot of people zoos are maybe the only time that they're ever going to come into contact with a mammal that's bigger than them um, or come into contact with a bird from the tropics or come into contact with an insect that's the size of their hand. So I think that that's a time that we should be explaining why these species matter and how lonely our world would be without them instead of sort of just like Oh, here's a you know here's an elephant, yay! And let's move on to the next animal. And you know, I think we need to say here's an elephant. Why are these animals endangered? Uh, what about forest loss? What about poaching? What about you know sort of these issues that are that are important that are not being talked about at zoos enough? Yeah, and then I like um, I like what you said at the end of the chapter. You said the zoo, if only it lived up to its purpose, could play a Mm -hmm. leading role in the preservation of creation, the saving of life. I hope it will take up its mantle and leave behind the immaturities that continue to plague it. I thought that was really good. Well, thanks. You know, I feel like zoos are often thought of as a place just for kids, that it's a place to take your kids. And that's great. And I think kids need, obviously, connection to to Mm -hmm. have that experience. But it really should also be like, an art museum where you go mm-hmm. learn about what you're seeing and it's a place that has some seriousness to it. Like it's, it shouldn't not be fun, but it should, you should come away with a different idea of your world with an expanded worldview. Um, and so that's where I feel like zoos sort of lose their mark is, is they don't take themselves seriously enough. They don't, they don't see themselves as plain. And I think a lot of them do a lot of good conservation work around the world, but then you don't, you go to a zoo and you don't even know that they're doing that. So I think they need to start telling us what they're doing and telling us what is the state of these animals in the wild and why. What have we done that has put these you know, other species and ecosystems into this position? Yeah, that's really uh, interesting what you said about the conservation work because um, lots of zoos are very deeply involved with conservation work. I know that a lot of the um, zoos uh, and uh, wildlife parks that have rhinos are very heavily involved with conservation in the range states of those rhinos. There are several really excellent programs. Um, And uh, I I agree. I think people do need to know more about that so that they can understand that there is a a relationship between zoos and conservation. Because I think Um, going back to what you were saying, um, the example that you used in your, your book about, uh, uh, the farm animals. I mean, (laughs) that was just so, uh, indicative, I think of, of what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I think that uh, you're exactly right on. I mean, I think that a lot of zoos do a, a tremendous amount of good um, overseas and on conservation issues, mm-hmm. both locally and internationally. And they put a lot of money where their mouth is. But then it's like you go to a zoo and they it's almost like they need a PR committee for their conservation work. Mm-hmm. Because 
you, you find very little information about it. And I'd love to see zoos set up lecture nights where they talk about it and open that up to the public freely. And I'd love to see signs that are in depth about the conservation work that they're doing. And, uh, you know, so that's where I see, I think, I think zoos need to be more concerned about reaching out to the public and treating mm -hmm. the public like adults and saying, okay, you are ready to tackle these issues. You are ready to know about these awful things that are occurring around the world. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the example you brought up is a farm uh, exhibit at the Minnesota Zoo, and I actually live in Minnesota, and the Minnesota Zoo is an exemplary institution. Um, I think it's one of the, you know, better zoos in the U.S., but I think it suffers the same thing where, you know, uh, it, it makes decisions maybe based on what it thinks is going to draw in more kids and not mm -hmm. maybe on what is really important for saving life on Earth. And, and I have nothing against the, what they did is they built a large farm structure and brought in lots of farm animals. And it, what's nice about it is kids can go in there, you know, play with animals and touch them a little bit and stuff. Mm -hmm. But what's what's not good about it is you have other places in Minnesota that have the same thing that are small local farms where you can go and do that. So why do we need a zoo that's putting in all this money for farm animals when I, I feel like it would be better spent on conservation issues, on animals that are endangered, animals that are threatened with extinction, and, and let the small local farms you know, continue to share their farm animals with the children and with adults. And I, I think that's a great experience. We've taken our daughter to that. Um, so I'm not discounting that at all, but I just think zoos should really focus on wild species. Right. I mean, I, I agree. And I, and like you said, there are zoos that are doing great work, excellent work. And then there are others that are just there with animals in cages with nothing yeah. and those are you know those are the ones that really have to change and aren't really um contributing to conservation they're just there for people to gawk at them yeah and that's a lot of you know a lot of the sort of the private institutions mm. use you know someone's backyard with wild animals and i'm let me just put out there i'm totally opposed to that I think <laughs> yeah much better regulations and i think that that's uh, really, not only is it detrimental to the animal, which, you know, it's just a sad state of affairs, but it's also, I think, bad for people to go and just see this animal in a cage and think that's what animals are meant for. Um, it's just a bad situation all around. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been to some of those and it's, it's really disheartening um, for some, you know, and I think, I think people just get the wrong impression. And I think zoos have made a tremendous leap in that they've they're creating bigger enclosures. They're creating enclosures that are more natural. They're they're allowing for space for the animals to be able to hide from people if they feel like that. And they're allowing for more enrichment activities. I mean, you can never recreate the natural habitat, but they're giving animals a better life. Um, but uh, that said, I feel like we then need to move on to actually saving those animals in the wild. Mm -hmm. otherwise, I feel like zoos are just going to be the last kind of sad little arc that we've put nature in and that's that to me is, is where i see zoos needing to go they need to sort of step up and become maybe even more politically active mm -hmm. and the ones that are involved in conservation work um like you said they need to really be um, pushing that and and talking about that and a lot of them are it's it's you know it's on their websites and they do mm -hmm. talk about it and those are um those are the those are the really um good experiences that I think should be shared. Yeah, exactly. I'd love, you know, I, I'd love to, I, I'd love to see zoos get volunteers out there at the, at the exhibits and telling people what, what the zoo is doing around the world. And, and like you said, like they, they do, I think there are definitely attempts. I just feel like they could start thinking outside the box a little bit more and mm -hmm. try and get more because they are doing, I mean, that's the thing. Zoos are one of the biggest funders of conservation worldwide. And so they are, they're doing that. I just want people to know, that they're doing that and that, that they have a stake in that and that this isn't just sort of a place where you go and you see an animal and two minutes later you see another animal and two minutes later you see, you know, mm -hmm. like people to really go and start to think about how our actions are affecting us. And I think this is one of the places to do that, um, one of the best places to do that because where else you can have that firsthand experience with the animal and then think about, okay, well, you know, what do I do in my day-to-day -day life that is impacting these ecosystems? 
Yeah, and uh, most people aren't aware uh, what you just said about zoos providing so much conservation funding. Uh, uh, most people aren't even aware of that. They um, they they just they don't see that that goes goes on. They don't see the good work that's going on. Exactly. Yeah, and I feel like if you know if I ran a zoo, that would be the first thing I'd want people to know. You know, mm -hmm. and be like, look what we're doing. Like this, we're awesome. And that's what I want zoos. I want zoos to tell us how awesome they are. <laughs> yeah, I do too, because I've been to some really, really, I don't even want to call them zoos, but I've yeah. been to some uh, really gorgeous uh, places. And it was, uh, I mean, it was a really nice experience. And I could see where, um, you know, it could most certainly be life changing for yeah. people to go and experience something like that. Well, and that's that's for me. That's where I've got my first sort of I think obsession with animals was at zoos, because that's I mean that was what we what we had, and so that was definitely my first encounters. And and I've been I'm one of the few people who's been fortunate enough to actually go see some of these in the wild, and that's altogether different. But it, I have to attribute my love of nature and wildlife first of all to zoos. So I think they do play a tremendous role, and I just I just wanted them to you know s step it up a bit. <laughs> if they don't mind me saying that. <laughs> as someone who's a big fan so <laughs> what what was uh you said your first experience or your first love of animals was at zoo what uh animals really grabbed you oh when i was a kid um uh snow leopard mm. komodo dragon um a lot of the really big jungle animals mm -hmm. um tigers of course a lot of the big cats and you know since then i mean i've I really have. I when I used when I started traveling around the world and seeing a lot of animals, I was still obsessed with mammals. And now, um, as much as I love mammals, I've become obsessed with birds, with insects, and fungi. And you know, the more you see, the more you're you you make all these interconnections between the different species and why they all matter. And um, but yeah, when I was a kid, it was a lot of the you know the classic big ones. So hmm. in uh, chapter ten. You wrote about why language matters. Mm. So we're just going to sort of do uh, a, an about face here. Um, uh, your, your example was game parks and the big five. Your example was, was something very well known that most people probably aren't thinking about, again, mm. because they haven't ever heard it put into other languages. And you... Um, I like the terms that you suggested uh, instead of those two more well-known terms. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this essay really came out about um, from, I've, I've been to Africa twice and I visited uh, Kenya, Botswana um, and South Africa and Zimbabwe. And, you know, a, a lot of the language used for tourists and for tour guides and sort of the, the safari experience is based in old colonial uh, terms about hunting animals. Um, and so it, you know, it just started to, to dawn on me that the way we speak about animals, uh, I think, I think is, is problematic a lot of times. And not, not to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a hunter myself, but I respect that hunters um, have done a lot for conservation. And I understand for many people why hunting is a very important experience and, and very, uh, makes a lot of their life, and I and I have no problem with hunting, especially if it's you know for food and things like that. Um, but the fact that these we're we're tourists going to see these animals, and we're not going to see them to shoot them, we're going to see them to take pictures and to have and to watch them. Um, that's the primary tourist experience in Africa now, and that's what guides are providing. And so the idea that we call them game parks, uh, which is a term that's used throughout Africa, is strange because game refers to something that you hunt or eat which is still done in places in Africa and I think if it's well managed it can be done um, but for the most part when when you go to a national park in Africa you still refer to it as a game park you don't refer to it as a conservation park or a wildlife park you refer to it as you know you're basically what we have it's colonial language and so I think that that provides a lot of uh, just mixed messages about what these animals are for and, and I, this might seem quite semantic and people I got a lot of mixed reactions from this article when it was initially published and I made changes to it and such but I do think that it matters how we speak about 
animals and about ecosystems and about nature. Um, the other example that you mentioned was the Big Five, and that one I think is even in some ways more problematic. Um, that that one is refers to the five animals that if you're going to go hunt in Africa, this is again back in the 19th century, early 20th century, when you'd have, you know, some white guy from you know, the UK would go over there and shoot something. Um, the big five was exactly what you wanted to hunt. You wanted to kill an elephant. You wanted to kill a lion. You wanted to kill a leopard, a uh, African buffalo, and the fifth one. Yep, the fifth one. The rhino. I know. Yeah, the rhino. So those are the those are what, like, makes a successful hunting trip, right? Mm-hmm. And so that has turned into now what makes a successful tourism trip, that somehow you want to see all five of these. And so it's, it's a weird conversion from you want to shoot all five of these to now you want to see all five. And I think it really puts a lot of bizarre pressure on guides and on tourists to suddenly like, as if, if, as if you didn't see all five, you'd have a bad experience, which is ridiculous because Africa is amazing and beautiful and there's thousands of species to see. Uh, and there's people to meet, and it's one of the most vibrant continents I've ever. I mean, it's just such an amazing experience to go there. And so it's just to me, it's first of all, it's just silly that we're focused on seeing these five species. Uh, and to, and also, I just think it it's it also is again indicative of that animals are there to be consumed, whether it's with your gun or your eyes, and not to be respected and not to be sort of awed at. I mean, I've I've been to Africa. I've been with other tourists, and it. It's just frustrating when people are so obsessed with, you know, seeing the big five and, and not just sort of letting what happens happen. Because that's when the adventure happens. That's when you have the, the amazing moment is when you just appreciate that bird that flew down that you've never seen in your life before. Um, or appreciate that cheetah on the hill. Or appreciate the herd of buffalo instead of focusing on, oh, have I seen an elephant yet? Oh, my God, I haven't seen an elephant. Um, I think that really takes away from the experience and takes away from our uh, comprehension of what nature is. It's not, nature isn't the big five. Nature is the big 10 million. <laughs> I like that. The big <laughs> 10 million. I like that. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope we keep it around. So I think that, that that to me is more important. I don't like setting up these hierarchies of what animal is better than what animal. And, and I think that, that that is something that we do in our language a lot. And we still do in science a lot. And so I think that's something just, and I'm not saying people can't use those terms. I'm not saying, you know, you, that we should change everything about sort of these historical, but I think I just want people to think about it, to think about what that means when we do say those terms. Yeah, I, I thought that chapter was really interesting. I mean, part of it is, you know, from writing, but it just made, it was just a new way of looking at something that is a part of people's everyday language. Well, yeah, and exactly, and I think that's why, like that, both that chapter and the last one we talked about the zoos have really, I've gotten very mixed messages on mm -hmm. both of those because they struck people as sort of being, and, I, and perhaps you know, rightly, I was being a little bit too uptight, and you know, my wife likes to call me a zoo snob, which is totally <laughs> true. Um, but I, it's, I, I, you know, I wrote those chapters more with an idea of of just getting people to think about things that we're mm -hmm. sort of complacent about, and less about saying like, you know. Let's change everything, and you have to listen to me because I don't. You know, I'm I, I'm coming from my own experiences and my own you know um, adventures, and um, I've been very fortunate. But I don't have the answers, so I'm just I'm trying to get people to sort of think about those things. Um, but it, 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 I don't want people to think that I'm somehow completely unfun to visit with a zoo. <laughs> <Yeah>. Unfun. <laughs> unfun. Yeah, I mean, maybe I am. Maybe it's true, but. Uh, I can still enjoy myself. <laughs> well, I don't think there was anything in the chapter really that said you didn't like zoos. It was it was more about zoos have so much potential. Yeah. Um, people just need to know about it. Well, and that's what I was hoping to get across, and I'm I'm, I'm glad you read it though. <laughs> well, works for me. <laughs> yeah, great. That's good. <laughs> Um, there were a couple of animals in the book that, uh, that stood out. Um, one was Tam, the Sumatran mm. rhino, and the other was the nesting leatherback. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't you tell us about what it was like to get up close to those animals? Yeah, well, it... 
both experiences were amazing and and quite different. Um, Tam, if, if if you don't know, Tam is a is a male Sumatran rhino on the island of Borneo. Um, he's in a semi wild cage right now. Um, I shouldn't say cage; it's a large enclosure. It's got real rainforest, and I mean it's in the rainforest. So, uh, but he was found in a palm oil plantation with a snared foot. Um, so his foot was quite injured, and he just walked into a palm oil station plantation one day and, and in a lot of he was extremely lucky because oftentimes if something like that happens i imagine the rhino would just be killed and the horn would be cut off and sold mm -hmm. um but this palm oil plantation the workers there they immediately notified you know the authorities and scientists were immediately called in so this this guy was saved and the reason why tam is so important is there's about 200 to 250 um sumatran rhinos left and Tam represents a distinct population in Borneo, of which there's probably around 40, maybe 30 left. Mm -hmm. um, so he's really one of the last of his species. And scientists right now are working very hard to see if they can get him and uh, a recent female that they have to see if they can make reproduction happen, which would be amazing. But I got to visit Tam a couple years ago, um, after like maybe a year or two after he was found. And... Uh, you know, it was just an incredible experience because I'd been to Africa and I'd seen African rhinos and they are beautiful and gargantuan and terrifying and, you know, they'll chase <laughs> your vehicle and they're just these magnificent beasts of power. Um, and yet, I mean, they're very gentle too, but, you know, you, you, keep, your, you keep your distance. But with Tam, uh, he was like a giant cat. And <laughs> <laughs> just he would cuddle up to the to his cage and he would whine for his food and make these sounds that sound like a whale like you know how whales mm -hmm. sing, just sort of sing to you and he you know he he was big so he was like almost crushing my hand when i was trying to take photos and it was kind of like ah oh, tam move but <laughs> um at the same time he was just so like gentle and and kind of like a like he didn't know his own strength um, and you can imagine an animal that lives most of its life deep in the rainforest as far away as possible from really humans, which is their major predator. Um, you know, he he has the means to be gentle. He doesn't really need to be too aggressive. And he just ate food right out of my hand. And he was just a, a really lovely, lovely individual. And then to, to be having this experience and realizing that, you know, by the time my daughter is an adult, there may not be any more Sumatran rhinos. Or if they are, they might just be doomed to a slow extinction. It's really um, sobering, you know, because you're having this sort of incredible experience with this other creature that is wholly different than anything else on Earth, yet it might not be around much longer. Um, so it was, a, it was a bittersweet but wonderful encounter. And I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have had that, and you know, to have had that opportunity to spend a few hours with Tam and to watch him walk a bottle back into his rainforest home. And, you know, it was, it was a really great, great experience. Oh, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I love Tam. I'm a, I'm a big fan. So <laughs> we always, we always cover him on Manga Bay just cause I have such a soft spot for him. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I like that. I've seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something's happened to Tam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's let's write about it. So, um, and yeah, the, the the other one, the the leatherback. Um, uh, you know, it again. You're talking about a giant, massive animal, and the leatherback is is so it's the world's largest sea turtle. And these things uh, evolved around the dinosaurs. They've been around for sixty to hundred million years. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. Um, but they're these incredible, they look like giant monsters as they come up on the beach. And they don't look like a normal green sea turtle. There's, their shell is a giant carapace that's attached to their skin. So they have this just armored reptilian look. Um, and all of a sudden, they'll, they'll, they just waddle out of the sea and come. And it's only the females who do this because they're coming on land to actually lay eggs. And they're just this burst of, you know, almost like a medieval monster. But they're they're wonderful and they're they're beautiful to look at and they're lo you know much bigger than you ever expect and you have to actually be very careful around them because they can knock you over with their flippers and break your leg. Um, so you have to be very gentle uh, hmm. and and cautious. Um, 
but just to watch these things that have been spending their whole lives in the deep ocean all of a sudden on land laying eggs is really one of the miraculous moments of nature. Um, the fact that they've evolved to, you know, come out of their deep water home for a few hours, lay some eggs, cover them over, and then go back to their ocean and, and do it again in, in a few years is really um, one of the most amazing things to see in nature that this animal is adapted to do that and also has just been around for as long as it has. And again, just like Tam, these animals are critically endangered. Um, the leatherback sea turtles, for a variety of reasons, for poaching, for taking their eggs, for beach development, for light pollution, uh, pollution in the oceans, they're, you know, they're drowning on plastic bags and they mm -hmm. eat all these things that they shouldn't be eating but is everywhere. Um, they're they're slowly vanishing, and there's a lot of great conservation conservation work going on with them right now, and there is hope that we can keep them around, but it's now it's you know there's no guarantee, um, and these are an animal that I think just like Pam and I think like all species really deserves deserves to be here as much as we do, and they are they are beautiful and wonderful and strange to behold, and you know I wouldn't trade that that experience for anything. Same thing with Tam. I'm there. You know, it's those kinds of things that as an environmental journalist that makes me really lucky um, and fortunate that I get to go and have these experiences with these animals, these encounters of them um, in their natural habitat and doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is what the leatherback was doing. Um, it was it was a really great time. Yeah, I... I love the description. I mean, some of the words that you use to describe her, I mean, monstrous, terrible, beautiful, <laughs> jaw-dropping. It was really interesting. I mean, I thought it was just such a great description. It really stuck with me. And so that's why, you know, I wanted to talk about it a little more. It just sounds like mm -hmm. an amazing experience. And like you were saying, you know, she's just doing what she, what her kind has been doing for millions of years and yeah. there you were just a spectator yeah and you want to give her a wide berth and, and that's the thing is like you you wish there was more words in our english language because you, you as as in a writer trying to describe this moment you just you grab on whatever tools you have and you try and capture it but you know she she is both beautiful and terrifying <laughs> and both ugly and the prettiest thing you've ever seen you know it, it's a strange just mix of reactions and you know that's just me as a spectator uh, entering her world for an hour you know and she probably doesn't mean you know she doesn't care that i'm there as long as i'm not doing anything to her and you know giving her a wide berth mm -hmm. and so i just i just felt very lucky to be an observer um and then to let her go on her way and I, I wish her well. I hope she's doing, hope she's still laying eggs because, man, we need more of them. They're just, they're just incredible animals. Oh, yeah. I hope she's still there, too, and I hope there's lots of turtle eggs and, and baby turtles. It's hard to resist a baby turtle. They're pretty Oh, cute. yeah, they are adorable. <laughs> it is insane. <laughs> they are, and we, um, so we were on a coast in Suriname, my wife and I, doing a two-week uh uh, uh, volunteer with the sea turtles and so we got to see a lot of baby sea turtles and it, you know they are so endearing but you also see how I mean there's a hundred hatch from each nest and then they have to make it to the ocean and mm -hmm. they they face uh, vultures and ants and fish and all sorts of tears just trying to get to the ocean and then you have light pollution which distracts them and confuses them um, but it, you know you see how this sort of collage of life occurs and these 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 turtles who you feel for because they're so cute yeah you watch vultures eating them and you, you try to understand okay the vulture is just doing its thing too and it needs that turtle it needs to eat that turtle but it you know you you get you get wrapped up in sort of this this classic um nature collision of predator and prey and you know and sometimes you just have to let the cute baby turtle be eaten but sometimes you also turn it over and save it when it gets lost because of the light pollution so it was it was a really neat experience to go there and you know just to see how these conservationists deal in the field day to day trying to get as many turtles as they can from the nesting site to the beach and that's, to the water. That sounds amazing. And yeah, vultures have to eat too. I have a exactly, soft spot. and and so do the ants and the you know yeah. all. I have a soft spot for vultures. <laughs> oh, vultures are amazing, man! Those guys are they're so yeah. I love vultures too. 
<laughs> Nothing birds of prey and vultures. They clean everything up. They're wonderful. And and yeah. they're <clears throat> excuse me, and they're highly intelligent. I mean a lot of people don't mm. know that. They're really, really amazing birds. <laughs> yeah. Well you have to be to, to live the way they do. I mean they have to they have to be smart enough to know where to find things and how to interact and how to share. I mean they're, they're really yeah, they're really ma- wonderful animals to see and watch. They don't get any respect, but they're great. Yep, I agree. <laughs> So what does give you hope? I mean, you wrote about the, you know, you wrote about a lot of really depressing stuff, <laughs> but you wrote about some good stuff too. So what, what does give you hope? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the book is, is I'm going to warn people, the book is a bit depressing at times. Um, <laughs> I hope that, that some of the descriptions and some of the, like, like the encounter with the leatherback and the encounter with Tam, I hope lighten it some. Um, but you know, a lot of things give me hope. I think the one of the main things that gives me hope is that we know the solutions to a lot of these problems. Uh, we know what's causing climate change. We know how to solve climate change. Uh, we know that we shouldn't be cutting down more forests. We have tons of people working on ideas and how to make that happen. Uh, we know we know what's causing our environmental deg- degradation. We know what's causing bio- uh, biodiversity to slip away. It's not like there's a you know, it's not like trying to deal with curing cancer, where it's where it's very mysterious sometimes what exactly is causing and how much, and we know what's causing this. I, I think the the problem lies in that there is a lack of uh, courage from our governments, um, from the public at times too, in in really tackling these problems. Um, so I think that's where the problem lies. But what gives me hope is that. We, as human beings, have done the research, we've done the findings, we've, we're monitoring this stuff. So we know what's going on. Uh, it's just a matter of getting people to act. And so what gives me hope on people acting is that I've, I've been able to travel a lot and meet with a lot of people who have dedicated their life to this. Uh, whether it's dedicating your life to saving a Sumatran rhino who might already be doomed, or dedicating your life to getting those little sea turtle babies from their nest into the ocean or, you know, dedicating your life to trying to find new means to stop rainforests from falling or protecting one patch of land or uh, regrowing a forest, for example, things like that. People have really, there's more and more people that are aware of these issues and there are more and more people who are really dedicating their entire life to save one species or to save one place or to change one government's mind about doing mining here, or doing mining there, or, you know, looking for fossil fuels here. There's, there's a lot of people out there that are really fighting for this. And so that, that gives me hope. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. I think we have to realize that we're going to have to, you know, keep kind of talking about these issues and keep bringing them up and keep telling our governments that things need to change and that we want, you know, nature around for our kids and our grandkids. But that said, I, I think there is a lot of people out there, and um, that gives me a lot of hope. I've met a lot of them, and really this book is dedicated to their, to their efforts, these scientists and these conservationists who are spending their lives working on these things. Um, they always fill me with awe and hope. So, Excellent. I Yeah, that is a hopeful message. I like it, and you're <laughs> right. The book does have some points that are that are. It's kind of hard to read it. You're reading it and it's like, we're doomed. But yeah. I, but you, there is such good balance in there and just what you said, you know, I think that people are going to make a big difference and we, we know the answers. It's just a matter of implementing the solutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say, you know, I would say never give up hope because the, the moment that we give up hope is the moment that basically everything, all these species are doomed. You know, there's always still opportunities and chances. And if one species goes extinct, and I've covered species going extinct, and that's one of the hardest things to cover. Mm-hmm. But yeah. If species goes extinct, I, I think it should be a rallying cry to save the ones that are still there. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't be a sense of, you know, we, we get a lot of comments in our articles on Manga Bay where it's like, oh, the world is doomed and we're all... And that's not what Red and I are trying to do. That's not our message. Our message is, you know, we know how to do this. We have these scientists doing the work. We have people recommending, doing great recommendations. It's just a matter of getting the moral courage to start changing some things. And changes are happening. I mean, it's 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 slow, but they're happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think that they're, you know, I'm I'm hopeful 
it's I'm not saying it's easy and I get, <laughs> get you talk to my wife, I get depressed, believe me. Uh, but these these creatures are still out there. The the world is still a wild and beautiful place and I've been able to see some of those places and there are still so many places worth preserving that to give up on any of this is is really the worst sin in my mind. Yeah. Well said. Thanks. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jeremy. It was yeah. really great to speak with you. It was great to speak with you, too. You've been listening to Conservation in an Age of Mass Extinction with Jeremy Hance, author and blogger from Manga Bay. This is Risha Kota Larson with Behind the Schemes.